In this video, we'll discuss Chapter 8, Section 1, Estimating a Single Population Mean. We'll start by focusing on the difference between a point estimate and a confidence interval estimate, and then we'll construct confidence intervals and interpret those for a single population mean using both the standard normal distribution and the t-distribution. What we've been doing so far is primarily calculating point estimates. A point estimate is a single number that we use to describe or estimate the population parameter. So for example, if we were to calculate a sample mean, that would be a point estimate, and we'd be using that to describe the population mean. We know that point estimate is not likely to be exactly the population parameter. That's what we talked about in Chapter 7.1 when we talked about sampling error. A confidence interval, on the other hand, provides us with a range of values. And that range of values helps us to not only understand a, an approximate value for the population proportion, but how much variability there is in the sample of data. The confidence interval is calculated using the point estimate and some measure of variation that we'll talk about in a moment. That measure of variation allows us to find this lower bound by taking the point estimate and subtracting that variation. We get the lower confidence limit or the lower bound. We use that same amount of spread, add it to the point estimate, and get the upper bound of the confidence interval. The difference between the upper bound and the lower bound of the confidence interval is what we call the width of the confidence interval. So far, we've been focusing on point estimates. We could estimate the population parameter mu by calculating a sample mean, x bar. We could also estimate a population proportion, pi, by calculating a sample proportion, p. The confidence interval is going to actually include in it uncertainty associated with the point estimate. So instead of getting us exactly at a particular point, we're actually going to get a range of values. That's why we call it a confidence interval, because it provides us a range of values. It takes into consideration the standard error. Now this confidence interval is calculated from a single sample of data, so we know that it's not going to be perfectly accurate, but we hope that we've gotten a sample of data that's fairly accurate, and that range of values will give us a good understanding about the true population parameter. The general idea when estimating a confidence interval looks something like this. We have this whole population, and pretend we're interested in knowing about the population mean, but we don't actually know what that is, so we want to use an interval estimate to talk about it. We'll draw a sample from that population and hope that that sample is approximately representative of the real population. We'll calculate the mean from that sample. So pretend that we're talking about age, and we get an average age of 50 in our sample mean. We'll take that 50, apply a little bit of statistical technique to that. We'll be able to say something like we're 95% sure that the true average age is between 40 and 60 years old. We'll get into some specifics here about what to add and subtract. So the sample statistic is our point estimate. In the case that we were just looking at, that point estimate would be x bar. We're going to add and subtract to that to get the upper and lower bounds, the critical value times the standard error. When we've been doing the cutoff problems where we try to find out some x cutoff or x bar cutoff that will allow us to have only 5% area in the tail, we've already been using the technique that we need to get this critical value here. This critical value is actually a z value or a t value based on a level of confidence, and it's drawn directly from the standard normal table or the t table. The standard error is the standard error of the sampling distribution. So what is this confidence level? Well, the confidence level will be how sure we are that the interval contains the unknown population parameter that we're attempting to estimate. This will be a percentage, something less than 100%. We usually use 90, 95, or 99%. There's another way to think about this. We call it the relative frequency interpretation. And what that means is that 95% of the confidence intervals in the long run will contain the true population mean. So the confidence interval we've created may or may not contain the true population mean, but we're 95% sure that it does, since 95% of the intervals would contain the true population mean. This is a visual representation of that same idea of the relative frequency interpretation of a 95% confidence interval. If we take a sample of data 
and we calculate the point estimate, we can use these confidence interval techniques to find the lower and upper bound. And we'll talk about this formula a little bit more coming up, but this is that sample mean minus some z critical value times the standard error. So we get a lower bound. We do the same thing but add to get the upper bound of that confidence interval. This confidence interval contains the true population mean. Most of the confidence intervals that we could create will contain the true population mean. In fact, if we use a 95% level of confidence, 95% of the confidence intervals are like these blue confidence intervals, where they do contain the true population mean. With a 95% confidence level, only 5% of the confidence intervals are like this red guy over here. This is from a sample of data where the sample mean is really low. And when we calculated the lower and upper boundaries of the confidence interval, that confidence interval did not contain the true population mean. In reality, we don't know if our confidence interval is like the blue guy that contains the true population mean, or like this red guy that does not contain the true population mean. All we can know is that if we've chosen a 95% confidence interval, then we're 95% sure that we're on one of the blue guys. And we only have about a 5% chance of being on one of these red confidence intervals that does not contain the true population mean. So we're going to talk about confidence intervals for the population mean, trying to estimate our mu, and we'll also talk about confidence intervals for the population proportion. That'll be in a video called Chapter 8.3. We'll start off by pretending that we know the true population standard deviation. So if we know the true population standard deviation and our population is normally distributed, or if our population is not normally distributed, we have a large sample size, our central limit theorem applies, then we can use this confidence interval formula that we were using just a moment ago. We take the sample mean, that's our point estimate, find a critical value and multiply it by the standard error. Take that whole right hand side, subtract it from the mean to get our lower limit of the confidence interval. And take that whole right hand side and add it to that sample mean to get the upper bound of the confidence interval. Finding the critical value. Consider the case when we want to use a 95% confidence level. What that means is that we want 95% of the probability to be between this lower bound and this upper bound of the confidence interval. Since we know the true population standard deviation, we're going to use a z-score. So I'm going to start by considering the standard normal distribution with the center at zero. And I want to know the cutoff, or the z-critical value, where 95% of the area will be between those boundaries. Because this is a normal distribution and it's symmetric, we know that then 5% of the area is outside these boundaries and that's split evenly between the two tails. So I have 5% divided by 2, or 2.5% 2 of the area is in the lower tail. The other 2.5% of that area is in the upper tail. To find these z-critical values, I'm going to use the z-table, or I'm going to use norm inverse, actually, because that allows us to draw values from the standard normal table in Excel. So how did I get this 1.96? I used the area in this lower tail and norm inverse. So norm inverse of 0.025, so 2.5%, comma 0 for the mean, comma 1 for the standard deviation, since we're talking about the standard normal distribution. That gave me a critical value of negative 1.96. When we actually fill that into our formula for the confidence interval, we use that in absolute value. So you see the z's below here. We would actually plug in the value of 1.96. We need to be 1.96 standard deviations below that sample mean and 1.96 standard deviations above that sample mean to create our 95% confidence interval. The most commonly used levels of confidence are the 90, 95, and 99 percent. I've shared with you some values here for the z-critical. Using a 90 percent confidence level, it's 1.645. A 95 percent, we just found it was 1.96. Remember, these critical values tell us how many of those standard errors we need to subtract from the sample mean to get the lower bound and add to the sample mean to get the upper bound. The right-hand side of this equation is actually called the margin of error. It's a measure, really, of how close we expect that point estimate to be to that population parameter, given some level of confidence. Because we have this z-critical here, we know that that includes some level of confidence. 
So we often write this margin of error as E, and it's really just the right-hand side, that critical value, times the standard error of the sampling distribution. The confidence interval is actually two times this margin of error wide, because we take that margin of error and subtract it to get the lower bound. We take the margin of error and add it to the mean to get the upper bound, so we've gone down one margin of error and up one margin of error from the sample mean to calculate the confidence interval. So the confidence interval is two times the margin of error wide. The margin of error then is also half the width of the confidence interval. We'd like that confidence interval to be relatively narrow because then we have a more accurate measure of where the true population parameter might be. To decrease the margin of error, we can do three things. We can decrease the standard deviation. Sometimes we can do that, sometimes we can't. If we're calling voters and taking a poll, it's not very likely that we can decrease how varied those opinions are. If we're talking about measuring liquids into bottles for our bottling company, like Coca-Cola, we might be able to adjust that standard deviation by fixing our machines or using new machines that we haven't used in the past. We could increase the sample size. This estimate gets more and more accurate. If we increase our sample size, the denominator gets bigger, which will make our margin of error smaller. The other thing you can do, but shouldn't necessarily do just to decrease the margin of error, is to decrease the level of confidence. If we decrease the level of confidence, we get a smaller z-score. There are trade-offs associated with this. A smaller z-score will create a smaller margin of error. So we will get a smaller or tighter confidence interval around the sample mean. The problem is we now have less certainty with regards to whether that confidence interval truly contains the population parameter we're interested in knowing about. So how would we calculate a confidence interval estimate for the mean? assuming that we know the true population standard deviation. We would collect a random sample of data, specify the level of confidence that we're interested in using, compute the sample mean from that sample of data, determine the standard error and the critical value. The critical value will determine from the normal table or norm inverse, and then compute the confidence interval. So let's walk through an example. Suppose that we're interested in studying circuit boards. We've collected a sample of 11 circuit boards from a normal population that has a mean resistance of 2.20 ohms. Past testing has shown that the true population deviation is 0.35. Create a 95% confidence interval for the true average resistance of the population. The first step is to find that Z critical value. So we've got a 95% confidence interval, which means 5% of the area is in the two tails. Norm inverse things to the left, so we have to put 0.05 divided by 2 in as our probability. Comma 0 for the mean, comma 1 for the standard deviation, and then I'm going to take the absolute value of that. Note that we get 1.96. Fill in the bits that we know. So we know that that critical value, that goes in where our z is. So we're going to fill that in with 1.96. The sample mean was 2.2. So where the x bar is, we put 2.2. Past testing has shown that the true population standard deviation is 0.35. So we put that in where the sigma was. Divide by the square root of the sample size. That sample size is 11. If we simplify the right-hand side, we'll find the margin of error here is 0.2068. So we're going to take this 2.2 and go down 0.2068. So subtract that out, and we get a lower bound for this confidence interval of 1.9932 ohms. Take that same 2.2 and add 0.2068 we get this upper bound of 2.4068 ohms. So what does this mean? It means we're 95% sure that the true mean resistance, if we could measure all the circuit boards and calculate the average resistance from those circuit boards, that that value would be between 1.99 and 2.41 ohms. To illustrate the impact that changing the confidence level has on a confidence interval, I want to use this example. Each year, the recycling company must apply for a new contract with the state. The contract is based in part on the pounds of recycled material collected. 
As part of this analysis, we need to estimate the mean pounds of recycled material. We don't know the true average, we have to estimate it. The city has asked for both the 99% and the 90% confidence interval estimates for this mean. So pretend we've collected recycling material from 100 customers to be weight. We know that we want to use the 99% and the 90% confidence intervals. After collecting and weighing the recycling material from those 100 customers, we found on average 40.78 pounds of recyclable material per household. The standard deviation of that population is known to be 12.6 pounds. We need to calculate the standard error. So to calculate the standard error, we take 12.6 divide by the square root of the sample size, which was 100, and we get a standard error of 1.26. We want to calculate two confidence intervals, so we need a z-critical value for the 99% level of confidence and a z-critical value for the 90% confidence interval. The z-critical value for 99% is 2.575. We need to be 2.575 standard errors below the, that sample mean and above that sample mean to create those confidence interval boundaries. Notice that number is relatively big compared to a 90% confidence interval. For a 90% confidence interval, we only need to go down 1.645 standard errors and up 1.645 standard errors. Our standard error is fixed at 1.26. So when we take our 40.78 and calculate a 99% confidence interval, we get 37.5 and 40.2 compared to using that 1.645 and getting 38.7 and 42.85. You notice that the confidence interval boundaries are closer together for the 90% confidence interval than they are for the 99% confidence interval. But we have greater certainty or confidence in the fact that the confidence interval on the left, our 99% confidence interval, contains the true average pounds of recycling per household. So a lower level of confidence will create a tighter confidence interval, but will be less certain in the outcome. A higher level of confidence will create a slightly wider confidence interval, but we will be relatively more certain in the outcome. Now the case where we don't know the true population standard deviation, that requires us to change something just a little bit in that calculation. If the population standard deviation is not known, we cannot plug that into our confidence interval estimate. Instead, we have to use the sample standard deviation. That's the one we've been calling S, and we calculate that using descriptive statistics or standard deviation dot S. When you use that sample standard deviation though, it adds uncertainty because each sample will generate a different value for S. There's sampling error for our standard deviation just the way there is sampling error for our X bar. To make up for the fact that we have this uncertainty when we have to use S, we use something called the T distribution instead of the normal distribution to get the critical values for our confidence interval. So you'll notice here in the formula, we've substituted a t in where the z was, and we've put s in where sigma had been previously. As long as our population standard deviation is not known, and our population is either normally distributed, or we have a relatively large sample size, in other words, our central limit theorem applies, we can use the student's t distribution. That calculation will look very much like what it did before. We'll take our sample mean, find a critical value and a standard error based on the sample of data. This right-hand side will still be called the margin of error. We'll subtract the margin of error from x bar and get a lower bound, add the margin of error to x bar and get an upper bound. The t distribution is actually a whole family of distributions. When we talked about the standard normal, it was a single distribution. But the t distribution is actually many distributions. So which one of those t distributions we're actually on depends on the degrees of freedom. And the t value that we get, how many standard errors we need to go out based on the t, will change based on the degrees of freedom that we have in our data. Degrees of freedom is really the number of observations in your data that are free to vary after your sample statistic has been calculated. Because we only are calculating one sample statistic, our degrees of freedom are n minus 1. We only have n minus 1 independent pieces of data after the sample mean has been obtained. So here's an example to help you understand degrees of freedom. It's the number of observations that are free to vary after our sample statistic, in this case our sample mean, has been calculated. Suppose that we know the mean of three numbers is 8. Pretend that the first data value is 7. Let's suppose the second data value is 8. We actually know that the third data value is predetermined. 
If the mean is already set, and we know that mean is 8, then the third value in the data has to be 9. It is not free to vary. Two of these data points can vary. One of them cannot vary. So we have two degrees of freedom. Our sample size is 3 minus 1. We have two degrees of freedom. That degree of freedom determines which t distribution we're actually on. If we have a small sample size, we will have a shorter and fatter t distribution. If you're looking at this and saying, this kind of looks like the normal distribution, well, it does kind of look like the normal distribution. The difference is that the t distribution is a shorter and fatter distribution, and it has greater area out in the tails. To create the same level of confidence, we will actually have to have a critical value that's farther out in calculating our confidence interval. What you do notice, though, is as the sample size gets bigger, our degrees of freedom go up, and our t distribution starts to look more and more like the normal distribution. The yellow curve is to represent the standard normal distribution. So you see the red curve is really short and fat with lots of area in the tails. The blue curve is taller and thinner with less area in the tails. That t distribution is beginning to converge to the standard normal distribution. Here's a table of some values of the t-distribution so you can see a similar thing in numbers. We're either going to use the t-table or t.inv.2t, that's the t-inverse function with two tails, to find our t-critical values. These are just a few examples. So with a confidence level of 80% and 10 degrees of freedom, we need to have a t-critical value of 1.32. If we increase our degrees of freedom, you notice those t-critical values get smaller and smaller. We can have the same level of confidence, but create a tighter confidence interval. And notice with the z, it's an even tighter confidence interval at the same level of confidence. With a 99% confidence and only 10 degrees of freedom, we'd have to have a t-value of 2.228. With the z, we can have 1.96. So you notice as we increase degrees of freedom, we get closer and closer to the z value. That means we get to have that tighter confidence interval, but we're still 95% sure that that interval contains the true mean. Those boundaries are closer together, which means we have a more accurate representation of the true mean. So this is one of the reasons that statistics instructors will talk about increasing your sample size if it's feasible. Let's run through an example for the confidence interval calculation when we do not know population standard deviation. So suppose that we have a random sample of 25 items. The mean of those items is 50. And we know that the standard deviation from that sample, that's the S, is 8. Create a 95% confidence interval for the mean. So we've got n minus 1, or 25 minus 1 degrees of freedom. That's 24. I use the t inverse function, so this tells me I'm getting a t critical value with 5% of the area in the two tails and 24 degrees of freedom. For the probability in the two tails, that's 0.05, and the number of degrees of freedom. If we do this calculation in Excel, Excel will give us 2.0639. That value is actually our t value that we're going to plug in right here. The sample mean is 50, so we put 50 in where x bar is. Put that t value in. We know the sample standard deviation is 8, divide by the square root of 25 because that's our n. Simplify this all down and we get 46.698 to 53.302. We know that we're 95% sure of whatever this true mean is, that it's in between these two boundaries.